We begin with the President of the United States. Just moments ago, the President leaving on a critical overseas trip, but a trip he is cutting short because of the looming crisis about the debt here at home. Today, the President says he cut that trip short to be back for the final negotiations on the debt ceiling. Right now, new key negotiators are meeting up on Capitol Hill. And last hour, the President said he is now confident there will be an agreement and that the United States will not default. America is not a deadbeat nation. We pay our bills. The nation has never defaulted on this debt, and it never will. And we're going to continue these discussions with congressional leaders in the coming days until we reach an agreement. The House Speaker Kevin McCarthy decided not to let the president have the last word. As the president, just after the president finished speaking, McCarthy says it's about time the president's negotiating. Now, the president and Leader Schumer have finally backed off their idea that they won't negotiate. They finally backed off the insane, unrational, unsensible idea that you just raise the debt ceiling. Let's begin our coverage with CNN's Jeremy Diamond. He's live at the White House for us. Uh, so a victory for the process, if you will, Jeremy. Progress on the process. The question is, what about the substance? Uh, that is the big question, John. And to be sure, there are still so many talking points with just 15 days potentially until the United States uh, defaults on its debt, if indeed that June 1st deadline stands. But today, the president expressing confidence that the United States will not default, mainly because he says there's no alternative. The United States can't default uh, on, on its debt. And uh, he also noted uh, that yesterday uh, we heard several leaders come out and say that all of the leaders, including the Speaker of the House, uh, acknowledge that uh, the consequences of default uh, would indeed be catastrophic. In line with that, President Biden has now elevated these negotiations uh, to three senior staff members, uh, the president's counselor, Steve Reschetti, uh, his director of o the Office of Management and Budget, Shalanda Young, uh, as well as uh, the director of legislative affairs, Louisa Terrell. On the other side, for uh, Speaker McCarthy, you have Congressman Garrett Graves, as well as the speaker's uh, senior staff. Uh, but the president, nonetheless, in an acknowledgement that this deal is going to come down to him and Kevin McCarthy cutting that trip short, uh, going only to Japan, not going forward with those stops to Papua New Guinea and Australia. And that's because he wants to be back for the final negotiations, which are expected to happen uh, next week, if indeed a deal is to be had. At the same time, John, as you just heard from the Speaker of the House, he is saying, look, the White House is finally willing to negotiate. They've dropped this pretense that they are not negotiating over the debt. Not quite. Here, if you talk to folks here at the White House, they still insist they are not negotiating over default. Nonetheless, what's clear is that they are negotiating over the spending agreement with that ticking time bomb of the potential for default hanging over them. John. Jeremy Diamond kicking us off in the White House. Jeremy, thank you. Let's bring the conversation in the room with me to share their reporting and their insights. CNN's Melanie Zanona, Francesca Chambers of USA Today, and Margaret Taleb of Axios. Uh, the idea that you're negotiating the budget or the debt, let's just say that's a difference without a distinction or a distinction yeah. without a difference, call it what you will. My question is, Kevin McCarthy gets a big win here on the process. Direct negotiations between the White House team and people he trusts on the White House team and the Speaker's office. The question is, how much wiggle room does Kevin McCarthy have on the substance? Because the House Republicans are not going to get everything they want. They're not going to get everything they want. Whatever they do come up with, there's going to be a sales job that Kevin McCarthy has to do to his conference. They've been trying to lower the expectation, particularly among conservatives, that what they pass in the House is not going to be the final deal, that they're going to have to be flexible. This is going to take some compromise. Uh, you're right that there is a small step forward in terms of process and structure. This is what Kevin McCarthy wanted all along. He wanted it to just be him and President Biden negotiating because he sees Biden as more flexible than some of these other Democratic leaders. And case in point, Biden is still leaving the door open to potentially some form of work requirements, which is something that Democratic leaders are warning against, saying it's a non-starter for them. But Kevin McCarthy feels like he has an upper hand right now and that he can get Biden to a good place. Uh, to that point, the president over the weekend said, hey, I voted for work requirements in welfare reform back in the 80s. The White House said, oh, gosh, and they scrambled to try to quiet progressive mm -hmm. complaints. They issued a statement yesterday afternoon saying the president was not going to accept work requirements. Speaker McCarthy says it's a red line. Today, as Melanie notes, the president opened the door, maybe just a little, but he opened it. I'm not going to accept any work requirements that's going to impact on medical health needs of people. I voted years ago for the work requirements that exist, but it's possible there could be a few others, but not anything of any consequence. Um, do we have any definition of what he means there? He, yeah. he said medical, so I assume he means Medicaid. That's right. Uh, we'll see if that plays out. But 
uh, SNAP or food stamps or food assistance. That's another area where Republicans are looking for. Is that what the president's opening there, or are we waiting for the White House he, to clean it up again? He is not. So <laughs> a White House official tells me that the, the, the president thinks that there could be some possibility in other potential areas, but as he went on to say, nothing of, of consequence. So SNAP, no. Uh, TANF, no. Medicaid, no. Uh, he's not willing to go beyond what he already voted for there. Now, one area that the White House is signaling that they could negotiate with Republicans on is those spending caps. They might be willing to agree to a spending cap. Now, the question of that would be for how long? Is this one year? Is this 10 years? But that is where you could see some potential movement. All right, the White House wants it to be one or two years. Then you get through the next election. They hope they win. They hope the Democrats pick up. This is part of the dance. Everyone's yeah. thinking about 2024. But we can go back to just the new, the president's new team, his budget director. Director Shalanda Young, who has deep experience up on Capitol Hill, a deep respect among a lot of the Republicans up there. Steve Urshetti, I know Steve from the Bill Clinton White House, has been around a long time, and Republicans have been in a lot of negotiations with him. Uh, Louisa Terrell is the president's legislative affairs director. Garrett Graves is one of the speaker's most trusted fellow House Republicans there. Uh, let me put it this way. You have adults in the room who know how to negotiate. The question is, why did it take so long? Because everyone was in this dance over whether or not we're going to negotiate? Yeah, because who's going to blink first? Yeah. But look, I mean, you have to, there is something that will get everyone across the finish line. For Kevin McCarthy, it's to maintain the speakership. He needs to bring enough of his caucus along that he doesn't lose power. For Joe Biden, it's two things, not to have a default and to get this postponed so this never has to happen again until after the next presidential election. Those two things are a win for Joe Biden. Why does he keep opening the door? Is it just because he's gaff prone and he can't help himself? I don't think so. It's because we have now 30 some years of polling, but at least five or six consistent years of immediate polling that show that actually Americans don't think that people should have a free ride, that the way you package this and talk about this matters, and that if, for better or for worse, it's usually for worse, there are two Americas. McCarthy is messaging to different voters than Joe Biden is. And what President Biden, I think, is trying to make clear is he is willing to um, talk about language that suggests that everybody try to work if they can, but he is not going to leave anyone destitute or uncovered for health care. There is a lot of wordsmithing and rhetoric attached to all of this. But when I heard McConnell and McCarthy say yesterday, nobody wants a default, to, to me, that says this thing is done and it's just a matter of every, I, I think. Right. <laughs> you have me back here in a week, it'll right. be wrong, it'll be right. a catastrophe. Yeah. But I think everyone is trying to get to the finish line with their own audience. And Biden uh, I, suggested there could be a deal yeah. also. He said that he's looking forward to signing it. But I, I think, again, putting that team in the room with somebody McCarthy Trust tells you they very much want to get it done. Yes. The question is, there are some difficulties. Let's move on. Another big thing that's going to happen today, that maybe it affects the mood in Washington, maybe it's just a sideshow, is the Democrats are trying to expel George Santos from the House. Uh, that does break sort of precedent in town, that normally it is your own party. If you're going to go to an extreme like that, it's your own party does it. The other party shouldn't be kicking out members of the other party. Listen to some of the Democrats, including the Democrats behind this morning, saying, look, George Santos is an embarrassment. He needs to go. The Republicans in the House now have an opportunity to either stand with the American public and their constituents or to stand with someone who has been indicted on 13 counts. To every member of the Republican conference from New York. I say to you, if you vote for this motion to refer it to the Ethics Committee, you are complicit in George Santos's fraud. Uh, again, a bit of a lesson on the rules of Washington for those of you watching at home who smartly don't read all of this. Uh, <laughs> it's a privileged revolution, so the Democrats have a right to get it to the floor because they filed it as a privileged revolution, resolution. The Speaker wants to then essentially have an amendment that refers it to the Ethics Committee, which buys him weeks, if not months. Let's put the New York Republicans up on the screen. Republicans have the majority in the House because they won a bunch of districts in New York State last year, some of them very competitive districts. These Republicans have want, they want Santos to resign. And yet tonight, the speaker's asking them, take one for the team. Don't vote to expel him. Vote to stall this. Will the speaker win on this one? It looks like they're going to have the votes. My colleague, Kristen Wilson, caught up with one of those members, uh, Mike Lawler. He said he's going to back McCarthy here, and he is going to vote to refer this. But he, he is confident that at some point, George Santos is no longer going to be a member of Congress. Really what this is, it's a delay tactic. McCarthy doesn't want to have to put his members on the record over this. He doesn't want to expose Republican division. So he thinks this is a way to sort of punt the issue. But it's not going to, it's not going to go away. George right. Santos is going to be a member of Congress. The House Ethics Committee at some point is going to make a conclusion. And we already have a lot of evidence about what George Santos has done. He pleaded guilty in Brazil to theft. He's been charged at least with 13 counts of you know, lying to Congress, money fraud, money laundering, wire fraud. 
He's also admitted to lying about his resume. It's just a huge black guy. For right. And so for any of those, again, the speaker says you need to be a loyal Republican. Vote with me to refer to the Ethics Committee. All of those New York Republicans who do that, within months, if not weeks or days, will have a TV ad or a radio ad against them uh, from the Democrats in New York who are trying to beat them next year. That's what some of this is about. Timing-wise, it's about politics.